relationship with God in the spirit as we look at the spiritual gifts. And I'm not going to teach, you know, necessarily about, you know, what the spiritual gifts are or, or you know, anything like that. But I just want to look at God's attitude and about the spiritual gifts in our life, I guess would be the way to put it. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is where I'm going to start. And verse number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 1. But notice what it says here. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. I would not have you ignorant. In regards to spiritual gifts, I would not have you ignorant. Now in regards to spiritual gifts, I would not have you ignorant. Now, we, we I use that word sometimes, and, and, and quite honestly, uh, as a child and, and a young person, I, I, I was in the South a lot, and we lived in the South quite a bit, and my family's from the South, and I have a hard time saying that word because, quite honestly, it was such a slang word down there. You know, everybody talked about, he's ignorant, he's ignorant, he's ignorant, every time somebody goes, he's ignorant, he's ignorant, he's ignorant. So it's hard for me to look at that word any other way than, than in that context. But the word ignorant here just means you have a lack of understanding. It means you have lack of knowledge in a worldly sense. But I'm going to look at it in a little bit different understanding. It's you have lack of revelation. He say, I would not want you to lack revelation concerning the spiritual gifts. I would not want you to lack revelation concerning the spiritual gifts. Now, what we need to look at here, and I'm going to use an example that I use quite often, and that was when Peter was talking to Jesus. And Peter was talking to Jesus, and Jesus says, who do men say that I am? And, you know, Peter went on and says, well, you know, some think you're Jeremiah, and some think you're Elijah, and some think you're John the Baptist raised up from the dead, and, and all these different things. And then Jesus kind of pinned Peter down and said, but Peter, who do you say that I am? And then Peter brought it forth and said, well, you know, you're the Son of God, you're the Messiah. And then Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who art in heaven. In other words, he had revelation from the Father about who Jesus was. He had revelation from God about who Jesus was. It wasn't a worldly knowledge. He didn't come to that knowledge through his human reasoning. He didn't come to that knowledge through his human thinking. He didn't come to that knowledge through his emotions. But the Spirit of God revealed that to him, who Jesus was. That's revelation. That's revelation. Each and every believer at some point in life, you have revelation from the Holy Spirit about who Jesus Christ was. And that's how you came to be saved, as you had that revelation of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit revealed him to you. And so we understand as we learn the Word of God, we're looking and allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal God's Word to us. To reveal God's truth to us. And so what he's talking about here, that he doesn't want them to be ignorant of the spiritual gifts, what he's talking about is, I want you to have revelation about the spiritual gifts. I want you to, I want the Holy Spirit to teach you about the spiritual gifts. That you would have revelation of them and you would have understanding of them. So that's really what we're kind of looking for tonight is, is, is to kind of look at that process, a look a little bit about that, and, and look at it in the context of revelation about the spiritual gifts. Now we know the Bible teaches us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I believe it's verse 23, that we're, as I always say, a tripartite <coughs> aren't we? We're three parts. We're spirit, we're soul, and we're body. I, you, know, you know what my body is, right? That's easy to see my body. Everybody knows what my body is. It's moving all around right now. So we understand that. But we also understand that, that we're spirit. We are eternal beings. There's part of us spirit that relates and has relationship with God. There's part of us that our spirit receives things from the Holy Spirit, receives revelation from the Holy Spirit. There's part of us in spirit when we worship and praise God, we're, we're in relationship with Him. When we're praying to God, we're in relationship to Him. We also have a soul, and that's in, in the context of this scripture, is talking about our mind and our emotions, our will, and that part of us. So when he's talking about not being ignorant here, he's talking about revealing something to our spirit. Because that's how we communicate with God, isn't it? The spirit of God witnesses to our spirit that we are his child. So the way that we know that we're born again, the way that we know we're Christian, is the spirit of God witnesses to our spirit. 
We know that through spirit to spirit communication. And so when he's saying, I would not have you to be ignorant, he's not just talking about we have a bunch of facts and ideas in our head and we have memorized the spiritual gifts and we can give some kind of definition to them. He's saying, I would have it that you have revelation about the spiritual gifts. So in the eyes of God, then, we can look at it this way. On one side, we have ignorance or lack of revelation. On the other side, we have revelation. In the world sense, when we think about ignorance, we think of lack of knowledge, <clears throat> lack of, of, you know, maybe an intellectual fact, lack of, you know, I always use the example, I choose to be ignorant of golf, and I don't mean that to offend golfers, but I choose to not to learn anything about golf. I don't know anything about golf. I've made a willful choice in life not to learn anything about golf. I'm okay with that. I'm all right with that. I know you guys are getting upset with me there, but, but I just choose to be ignorant of golf. And people want to say, why? And I say, for a very good reason. I, I look at golf and it doesn't look like it's fun to me. But I'm also smart enough to know that everybody I've ever known who played golf really liked it. And people who really like it, then they end up spending time playing golf. And then they tell me how expensive it is. So why? So I don't have a, I don't have spare time. And I don't have that much spare money. So why should I learn about golf? I have something else to spend money and time on. So at this point in life, I make a willful decision to be ignorant of golf. But God's saying here that we don't make sure we don't make a willful decision to be ignorant or lacking revelation about the spiritual gifts. Now, it, to me, it's kind of funny. Whenever I go to these chapters and I, and I read that, it always just hits me because you know what? You have it, no offense to anybody, but a lot of the church is. A lot of the church is. A lot of the church is. Ignorant of the spiritual gifts or lacking revelation about the spiritual gifts or lacking understanding about the spiritual gifts. And, and so we're going to look at that tonight. And it's important, though, is, let me backtrack for just a second. And we'll understand why this is so important. Because I just brought the idea about being three part-time being. You know, we have, have the body, we have the soul, and we, have the, and we are spirit, right? We're the greatest ways that most Christians I've ever seen in my life get into trouble is they're following their emotions or their human reasoning and not walking by the Holy Spirit. And that's the greatest way that Christians, you know, and one of the greatest troubles and problems I've seen with the spiritual gifts is Christians who don't have that discernment to know the difference between their emotions and their spirit or their human reasoning and their spirit. And that was, they're always saying, well, Pastor, and I haven't had this issue in the church for a long time. I really haven't. There was times when I was constantly dealing with this. And then people were always coming to me, and, and, and you know, you just knew me on a shadow doubt by the stuff they were telling you. God spoke to me, and God told me this, and God gave me this, and God gave me that vision, and God, and it was just absolutely contrary to the Word of God. And I knew beyond a shadow doubt, no, that's not God. That's your emotion. That's your flesh. That's your personal desires. And to watch those people time and time again just shipwreck because they didn't have the understanding of the difference between the leading of the Holy Spirit and their own personal emotions. And usually when somebody's in that mindset, they're not real receptive when you say, no, that's probably not God. Because usually the first response you get at that point is, wait a second, I know the voice of the Lord. So as soon as you get all upset and you hear God and nobody else does, red flag, you're in trouble. So it's very important we understand this. And very important we understand how God, how the Holy Spirit works. Because in the same way that the body of Christ has to a great degree, many cases been shaken by that and afraid of that because of those elements. You see, beloved, that's who our teacher is. That's who's given to lead us and guide us. That's who's given to instruct us. As a matter of fact, the Word of God says the child of God is who? That is that person who's led by the Holy Spirit. For as many as led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. So one of the distinctions of a child of God is there's somebody who's led by the Holy Spirit. They're not led by their emotions. They're not led by human reasoning. They're not led by tradition. They're led by the Holy Spirit. So you see, these are very important things. You know, and just sometimes when we look at the Word of God, and you, and you look at certain examples, it's obvious.
obvious that that person had to be led by the Holy Spirit. I mean, you know, Jericho. I mean, how many of you go out here and you're in the battle and, and there's this great walled city and, and the great the, the reputation of this city in the time is it's impregnable, there's nothing you can do, it, it, it's just, you cannot defeat it. And you think, you know what, I've got a good idea. Why don't we march around it for seven days? And on the first six days, we won't say anything. And on the seventh day, we'll march around it seven times, and then on the seventh day, we're all going to shout the walls to come down. That's a great idea. Probably not. How many of you think that their emotions at that time wanted to do that? Probably didn't, did they? What are you talking about going out there and walking around that hill? They're going to be shooting at us. Shooting arrows at us, throwing fire at us, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. You see, obviously in a situation like that, it was the Holy Spirit, wasn't it? Because the human thought, the human reasoning would not come up with that idea. Nor would their emotions. But that was God's plan for victory. So if they were not hearing, in the case of Joshua, if he's not hearing from God, then they're not saying the victory. And a lot of times, beloved, I'm convinced as believers, one of, the reasons, one of the reasons we're not seeing victory is for the simple reason we're trying to do it by our emotions. We're trying to do it by our human reasoning. Or we're trying to do it by tradition. So let's look at a couple, three things real quick. Go to Matthew chapter 15. And I'm just going to walk us through a few scriptures tonight. And it's not any great new revelation, I'm sure, for most of us. But it, it's just kind of an encouragement to not be ignorant in the things of the Spirit or the gifts of the Spirit. Matthew chapter 15, verse 6. Notice what Jesus says to these individuals here. And honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Or in other words, you could say, thus you have made the word of God of none effect by your tradition. Now when it comes to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, over the years there's been a lot of tradition that has been erected about it. You know, and I shared some about my personal testimony a little bit when, when I came into Christ and began to serve God and and I had people who began to talk to me some about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and began to share with me about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. On the other side of the corner, I had people who, who were Christians who were sharing the exact opposite. They were saying, you know, that, that's done. That, that, that's done. That doesn't exist anymore. Don't believe any of that stuff. Stay away from those people. Get away from there. That's not right. Because they were sharing their tradition with me. Their tradition was that the baptism of the Holy Spirit did, wasn't in, in, in effect anymore. Their tradition was that the gifts of the Spirit were not in effect anymore. And their tradition had shot down the Word of God. Now, here I was. I, I didn't know. I was a young believer, freshly born again. People who told me on one side I, I were people that I trusted. People who told me on the other side were people that I trusted. And so I'm thinking, you know, what are we going to do here? What am I going to do? So I did the, the, what obviously you should do. I began to dig into the Word of God. And I began to examine the Word of God to find out what the Word said. Because I wanted to know what is true here. What is God's truth here? What does His Word say? And I began to dig into it. I began to study. And I began to come across something. You know what? There's nothing in here telling me the gifts of the Spirit have ceased. There's nothing in here to tell me that the baptism of the Holy Spirit has ceased. As a matter of fact, the Word of God says just the opposite. And so if the Word of God declares that it's for today, if the Word of God declares that it's true, then I have to go with the Word, what the word of God says. You see, because I, I could, if I could embrace that tradition, I could accept that tradition, and that tradition would have cast down the Word of God and made the Word of God of none effect in my life. You see, beloved, there's a lot of religious tradition that has been erected by man that doesn't line up with God's Word. And a lot of that tradition is in the, in the area that we're talking about, about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Beloved, there's a lot of the body of Christ, and I'm not picking on anybody, I'm not knocking anybody, I'm just examining what the Word of God says that does not operate.
operate in the spiritual gifts. There's a lot of Christians who, 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 who that's not a part of their life. There's a lot of ministries that that's not a part of their life. And the reason is, is because they've accepted traditions that have made the Word of God of none effect in their life. And they say, you know what? I, I'm not even going to examine it. I'm not even going to look at it. I'm not even going to study it. There, there's a mindset of those then that say, well, you know, Pastor, I, I believe the gifts exist. And I believe in the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But I also believe that, you know what, if God wants to do it, he'll do it. Is that biblical? It sounds good, doesn't it? Not our little Lord the earth be done. If you want to do that in my life, you do that. Lord God, if you want the gifts to be working in our church, let them work in our church. If you want the gifts to work in my life, God, let them work in my life. And be done with it. That sounds spiritual, don't it? It sounds good. But it's contrary to the Word of God. The Word of God does not tell us to just approach the spiritual gifts that way. Let me read the scriptures to you. First Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to bounce around a little bit. First Corinthians chapter 12. Verse number 31. So what should our attitude be then? You know, tradition with some is that it doesn't exist. It's not a way. Huh? The word of God no word says that. Tradition of some is just, you know, let it be. Case of raw surprise. God wants it, it'll happen. And a lot of the body of Christ looks at it that way. A lot of churches look at it that way. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31 says, But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. So what's it tell us? That gift way, if the gifts show up, that's fine. And it says, covet. 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 Covet earnestly the best gifts. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. Follow after charity or love and desire spiritual gifts. So it tells me in one verse, I'm supposed to cover this, covet the spiritual gifts. Another verse, it tells me I'm supposed to desire the spiritual gifts. It don't sound to me like we're supposed to sit on our hands and say, well, if it happens, it happens. It sounds to me like God is telling us we're supposed to pursue this. It sounds to me like I'm supposed to be looking and asking God and pursuing God for the manifestation of the spiritual gifts in my life. It sounds to me like we as a church are supposed to covet and desire and pursue God and look to God for the manifestation of gifts of the Spirit in our life. It sounds to me that, if that the body of Christ is supposed to be coveting and desiring that the spiritual gifts operate in their services. It sounds to me like we're not just to be sitting on our hands and thinking, Lord, if it happens, it happens. Sounds to me like we're supposed to pursue it. Now, that's just my interpretation of covenant and desire. Yeah, I don't know how else you can look at it. You might say, well, let's just let's go to another example. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Verse 12. Even so ye, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. Zealous and seek. It sounds to me like we're supposed to be seeking the gifts of the Holy Spirit for the edifying of the church. You see, it, it sounds to me like we're supposed to desire them. We're supposed to hunger them. We're supposed to pursue them as individuals and as a body. It sounds to me like God is telling the church here to pursue the spiritual gifts. Not let it sit there. Not put it on a shelf somewhere. Amen? Now, you might say, well, let's go to Mark chapter 6. And some of these things here apply to many things, but one of the things that can be greatly hindering is unbelief. Some of you say, well, I don't know about all that stuff. I don't believe in that. Well, probably not going to happen if you like that. Well, our church don't believe in that. Well, you're not going to see it happen. 
comes in disagreement with God. So it could be a matter of unbelief. Because you know, beloved, we can have traditions that cast down the word of God and make it of none effect. And we also can tie the hands of God by unbelief. Mark chapter 6. Let me show you that. Don't look at it like I'm crazy. And this is talking about Jesus. And he could there do no mighty work. Jesus could do no mighty work there. There is a time and a place in the Bible where it says Jesus could do no mighty work. Save that he laid his hand upon a few sick folk and healed them. Now, my understanding of the Greek words there is, you know, minor stuff, he heals the headaches. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about their villages teaching. Now, there, there's three things there that I would like to bring out to our attention. One is Jesus could do no mighty work there. The reason Jesus could do no mighty work there was because of their unbelief. And we can say, well, if it's God's will for the gifts of the Spirit to be manifest, he will. Not, he, not if there's unbelief. He's not going to flow through unbelief. And if you notice there, Jesus, even himself, marveled, what in the world is going on here? But you notice Jesus didn't quit. And then it says he went teaching. Why did he go teaching at that point in time? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So he marveled at their unbelief, but he didn't just give up on them. He began to teach them the word of God. He began to give them the word of God. You see, beloved, people might say, well, I don't know, we haven't seen the spiritual gifts in our church for 137 years since great, 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 great grandma once prophesied. That don't mean God gave up. Teach the word. Proclaim the word. You see, beloved, I am absolutely convinced by the word of God, this is an area where we're coming up short. I mean, you could go down and look at the spiritual gifts and you'd say, yeah, River Black, we, we see spiritual gifts manifest, and we do. But so much more is in the word. Yeah. I mean, in all honesty, how many miracles, manifestation of the gift of miracles are we seeing in, 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 recently? I'm 
I've been studying God's Word for over 30 years now and seeking God and pursuing God for over. I still feel like I'm in kindergarten. So. Maybe you are. Maybe you guys feel like you graduated. But Acts chapter 17, verse 11. These were more noble than those of Thessalonica, in that they received the Word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. And that always has to be how we approach the things of God. We should always be Bereans. And any matter we look at, we should always examine the Word of God. When it comes to the spiritual gifts, where do we find our truth at? From the Word of God, don't we? We don't look at church tradition. We don't look at our personal experience. We don't look at what we think. We don't look at our emotions. We look at what the Word of God says. And the Word of God tells us not to be ignorant of it. The Word of God tells us to desire it. The Word of God tells us to, to be zealous of it. The Word of God tells us to covet it. So apparently, if we examine the Word of God and go by what the Word of God says, that should be a part of our life. Desiring and seeking and coveting the spiritual gifts in our mind and in our churches. Amen? Amen. You see, we've got to understand something here. Go to John chapter 14. Check that box box. John chapter 14. We have a teacher. John chapter 14, verse 20 says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So he, the Holy Spirit, is our teacher. Later on in John chapter 16, Jesus said he will guide you into all truth. So the number one function of the Holy Spirit upon this planet is to teach us. Is to be our teacher. The number one function of the Holy Spirit upon this planet is to be our teacher. So if we have the Holy Spirit says to teach us, there's no excuse to be ignorant of the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit said to teach us, there's no excuse to be ignorant of the spiritual gifts. Other than the fact that we're just not pursuing it and looking into it. Or else we've just accepted tradition somewhere along the line. Or we've accepted the lack of the manifestation of it somewhere along the line. I uh, was just kind of thinking today here. I was looking at this, and I thought, you know, we can break this down into real simple things. God really desires to teach us. He really does. He gave us his word to teach us, didn't he? Why do we have his word? What's the purpose of it? That we would read it and learn it and have understanding of who God is, understanding how the kingdom of God works, that we would learn and have understanding. It was sent here and given to us to teach us. He sent his Holy Spirit. And the reason he sent his Holy Spirit, one of the primary functions of the Holy Spirit, is to be our teacher. And, and, and that's one thing, occasionally I'll just stop and I'll kind of begin to meditate on that. And that is something I'm absolutely 100% convinced that we as the body of Christ have to begin to tap into. The Holy Spirit's our teacher. He has all knowledge. He has all understanding. He knows the word. He wrote it. Do you realize what revelation we have access to? And what understanding we have access to? What wisdom we have access to? And just take a, an area like this that we're talking about tonight, the spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit gets in to teach us about them. The word of God is given to teach us about them. God has... Then he set up the fivefold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. To do what? To equip or teach the saints the work of the ministry. Or that would be the spiritual gifts we So we have the word to teach us. We have the Holy Spirit as our teacher. God has given the body of Christ teachers and he gives them to men. So apparently, apparently he wants us to now, go to Proverbs chapter 2. Say, we're bouncing around tonight. <clears throat> Proverbs 
See, none of this to me indicates that we're supposed to take a lackadaisical attitude about this. <coughs> Amen? Yeah, you're with me so far. Proverbs chapter 2. Verses 4 through 6. Hug and what knowledge. If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Notice that. Notice that. Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Verse 4, when is that? If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hidden treasures. <clears throat> One of the things that the Lord has used over the years to really kind of give me an understanding of this. Think about somebody who wants to be a doctor. And they go to school high school, they go through college, they go through medical school, they go through an internship. Have you ever known anybody who went through that process? They go off to sleep. I had a friend one time who was just coming into the internship, and that man didn't very often sleep. Why? He was pursuing knowledge. He was pursuing the knowledge he needed to be a medical doctor in this world. He was pursuing the knowledge that he needed to function in this country and this society as a medical doctor. But yet you look at so many Christians' lives and they have the Word of God. They have the Holy Spirit. And they are lacking in knowledge about the things of God because they're not pursuing it and realizing it. The treasure that it is. Like I said, you, I don't know about you guys, you ever said and just think about that? The Holy Spirit is your teacher. What an amazing teacher we have access to. How much are we pursuing that as a treasure? How much are we pursuing that as, a, as the greatest riches of life? But we're just going through the motion so often and accepting tradition rather than pursuing the revelation that God has for us. That's good. We need to pursue this treasure. You know, every time I, I, I tell a terrible story, every time I hear this, I remember an example when I was a kid. And this is terribly mean that some neighborhood kids did this to it. Mm -hmm. And there was this guy who owned this property, and they made up a treasure map and uh, drew up a treasure map and did all this stuff and made it all look old and nasty. And they went to this guy <coughs> and told this guy they had found a treasure map. And that actually it showed that there was treasure in his property. Well, that guy tore up his whole yard. I mean, he dug his yard up hunting for that treasure. I mean, all around his house, he totally tore, tore up that yard hunting for that treasure because those guys had convinced him there was treasure in his property. And you think about that, how much do people go out of there? Look what people do to dig up treasure. And if I tell you out here there's all of this land and, and out there there's there, there, you know, $20 million worth of silver buried out there, there's a lot of folks who do a lot of digging. A lot of people do a lot of pursuing, spend a lot of time, a lot of energy, and a lot of effort trying to dig up that silver, that treasure. But tonight I, I stand before you and I tell you there's a glorious heavenly treasure that we have access to. And the Holy Spirit's our teacher. And he will reveal the word of God to us and give us understanding. Not only about the spiritual gifts, about anything in the kingdom. Would we respond and pursue that treasure the same way we would silver? I mean, this is a far greater treasure. than all the silver and gold in the world. There's absolutely no reason, beloved, for the body of Christ to function in we have access to the wisdom of God. We have access to the knowledge of God's kingdom. We have access to understanding the things of God. The Holy Spirit, the greatest teacher that can be imagined, lives on the inside of the believer. Amen. How would that work out? 
You see, one of the things that has happened, I think, we have been handed so much a traditional model or a traditional role of Christianity that we're not really going to the teacher or accepting the traditional. I was having a conversation Saturday morning with you guys know Lorenzo, Pastor Lorenzo, and we were talking. And I was talking to him about something he said and when the last time he preached here. They had really just kind of jumped inside of me. And, and it was kind of neat because as I as I was sharing with that, he had, last time he taught, he was teaching about the book of Acts and how, you know, the day of Pentecost, how they were waiting for the Holy Spirit. And they really didn't know what to expect. I mean, you and I have understanding of it because we have the Word of God. We have the entire New Testament. We have the written record of what happened when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. They didn't have that. They didn't have the, the New Testament. And his point was that they had to totally depend upon relationship with him to understand who he was because they didn't have the Word yet. And as I was talking to him about that, we're sitting at breakfast, I'm sure that was it. Just not talking about that, I mean, I just felt the quickening in my Holy Spirit about something. And I'm like, you know what, Lorenzo? They did know what to expect. They did have understanding. They didn't have the Word of God, the New Testament, telling them what to expect when the Holy Spirit come. But they did have the experience of walking with Jesus for three years. And their model of what happens when the Holy Spirit comes was what Jesus did when he was under the anointing. And what did Jesus do? He healed the sick. He cast out demons. Raise the dead. What did they then do when the Holy Spirit came? Exactly the only model they had. Hey, Jesus said that when, when the Holy Spirit comes, we'll have power too. He said when the Holy Spirit comes, we'll do the works that he did. So that's what happened when the Holy Spirit came on him. So the Holy Spirit comes on us. So what are we going to do? Let's go do what he did. That's the only thing they knew. The only thing they knew was that when the Holy Spirit comes, you have power, you lay hands on the sick, you cast out demons, you raise the dead. You speak to the storms? That's the only model they had. That's the only understanding they had. But today, people look at it and think, well, when the Holy Spirit poured out, what's going to happen? They had all these years of church history and tradition they look at. Maybe it would do us good to go all the way back and say, I don't know, when the day of Pentecost came, when the day of Pentecost came, when the power came, they touched literally what Jesus said, they shall do the works of Christ, and maybe that's the model we have, and that's the model we're meant to have, is what Jesus did, what the early church did, what the Word of God records, and maybe we need to throw everything else out but the Word of God and go by that. Hallelujah. Just a thought. Just a thought. And I don't know why that just lit up inside of me the other morning as I was talking to him, and I thought, you know, they did have that model. And that's why maybe why it was easy for them to walk in. Because that's the only example they had ever seen. That's the only instance they had ever seen. was a model of Jesus Christ. So maybe we need to meditate in the Word a little bit. Maybe we need to spend some time in His presence. And maybe we need Him to instruct us and teach us. Let me go to 1 Corinthians 14. Let's go back there for a minute. Say, yeah, but what about being decently in order? That's a good one. Yeah, Pastor, I know you're talking about the gifts of the Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, and all that stuff, but don't you know the Bible says everything has to be done decently and in order? It does say that. And I'm going to read that to you, and then I'm going to challenge you on man's understanding of that. And I'm going to be nice about it. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40. And this is at the end of the chapter here, dealing with exactly what I'm talking about, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Let all things be done decently and in order. Okay. I've heard that quite often throughout my life. Decently and in order. And one day I, I just had a, a moment of revelation from God that really kind of hit me about that. Who's order? Who's order? God's order. God's order. God's order. Not man's order. See, usually the 
20 minutes and sat down and that was over. Don't be dead in the mud. That's your decently in order. That's not the word of God's decently in order. Let's look at God's order for a second. What is God's order? God's order is that we desire and covet and are zealous of the spiritual gifts. That would be God's order. That's what 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 is all about, is how we conduct ourselves in regards to the spiritual gifts in, in, in the church services or in our lives. And he's telling us to covet them and desire them and zealous them. So if you're not coveting the Holy Spirit, you're not desiring the Holy Spirit, you're not zealous about the Holy Spirit, my friend, you're out of order. Out of God's order. And you're not decent and you're not in order. Because our order comes from the Word of God. Think about God's order. <coughs> you see, when we hear the word order, normally speaking, we think of uniformity. Don't we? We think of uniformity. Man's order is uniformity. And that's why we, and I'm not giving my opinion, but I'm trying to a church. That's why a lot of churches and our church traditions, and you go to all the different churches all across the country, and they're all very uniform. They sing the same hymnal songs. They may preach the same things. It's all uniform. Conform one to another. Uniformity. Now, stop for a moment and look around. How much uniformity do you see in God's creation? Now, Gina Dean was here, they looked nothing like they blow it out of the but, but look around you. Look at God's order. We all look different, don't we? Yes. God's creation looks different. Go on in for a walk in the forest and look at the trees. Are they uniform? A lot of, a lot of differences in there. Go look at God's creation. God's creation is diversity. It's not uniformity. So God's order is not uniformity in his creation. Why do men think that his order is uniformity when it comes to church? We all dress alike, we all look alike, we all say things yeah, no, young That's not God's order. That's not God's order. Think about that for a minute. I'll just look at the stars. And then come back out tomorrow and look at the stars. Why don't they always look the same? If God's order is uniformity. Matter of fact, I think I'll challenge you to find anywhere where God's creation is uniformity. I'll challenge you to find anywhere where God's order is uniformity. I'll challenge you to find anywhere in the, in, in the ministry of Jesus where he was in uniformity. I'll never forget a time when we had service and it was, just, it was different. And uh, it was real different. <coughs> and I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, why can't we just have normal services? And he said, Mike, I want you to go to the Word of God and show me where Jesus ever had normal service. Yeah. <laughs> Great point. I mean, he got interrupted by demon-possessed people on a regular basis. He got interrupted by people who wanted to throw him off the cliff. I mean, he got interrupted by people, you know, you know, coming down through the ceiling, busting holes in the roof. <laughs> show me where Jesus had uniformity in his services. <clears throat> Matter of fact, it was pretty wild hanging out with him, wasn't it? He didn't even know how to act at funerals. He wasn't somber and sad. He raised the dead. How's that? That's rude, ain't it? Don't know even how to act at a funeral. Don't know how to be uniform at a funeral. Here's an interesting thing. Boy, I'm getting way behind here. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let me make one last quick point. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 5. Because this, I, I'm just going to touch upon one of these. I was going to look at administrations and operations and manifestations. Jesus talks about three works of the Holy Spirit administrations. Being number one, I was going to get out. Operations and manifestations. That's in verses 5, 6, and 7. But 
that this ties so closely to order. Administrations. And there are differences of administrations. The administrator of the church is the Holy Spirit. The administrator of the church is the Holy Spirit. I mean, think about this for a second. So the one who's kind of the organizer, that's what administrators do, they'll be organizing. They put things in order. Would be God, the Holy Spirit, is the administrator or the organizer of the church. Something that the Lord had just been sharing with me so much lately. And it's just really <laughs> causing me to look at the body of Christ with a different understanding than I've had before. Not that it's new revelation, but a different understanding. The body of Christ tries to put itself together. <coughs> and we try to put ourselves together by the way we think we're old. We, we look for a church. And we look for a church and, okay, well, let me go into this church and check it out and see. There ain't very many people here my age. I remember when I was young, especially when I first saved, I was 25, 26. I go to a church. Everybody was what I perceived as being old, they like my age. And uh, they sang rock of ages. And I'm like, oh, boy, I'm <laughs> Can't go to that church. There's nobody my age group. Well, you might go to another church and think, can't go to that church. I don't even like that kind of music. Well, I can't go to that church. I only make $20,000 a year. And I, all those people, they're all doctors and lawyers. They make $100,000 a year. Can't go to that church. They all wear suits and ties. <laughs> can't go to that church because they, they just, you know, they're all well educated and I'm not. We tend to kind of come together and put ourselves together because we're deciding where we are by worldly standards and decisions and choices. We try to find a church where we fit in rather than let God fit us in. He's the administrator. He's the administrator. He's the administrator. He's the administrator. He puts the pieces together. And how God puts us together has nothing to do with our social standing. It has nothing to do with our education level. It has nothing to do with our economic standards. It has nothing to do with our race. It has nothing to do with any of the stuff that the world likes to use to think that that's order. Why would God do it according to the world's standards? And the problem we're facing quite often in the body of Christ is we're not allowing the Holy Spirit to be the administrator. We're doing that ourselves. Well, I just think that's what your job is. I like their kind of music. You know, little cats when they play that one song. Maybe uh, they'll let me play the, the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, you know, they, they, they grill the back rows cute. You know, we got all kinds of stuff. Maybe they'll let me play on the basketball team. For the Holy Spirit to be the administrator, he has to be the one putting the pieces in. Right. That simple little thought, how much that changes the complexion of the body of Christ right there. When we stop looking for the church where we want to go and allow the Holy Spirit to put us where he wants us to be, it changes the complexion, doesn't it? I used to, when I was at Faith Open Love, quite often we used to have communication with uh, Times Square Church, David Wilkerson's ministry in New York. And one of the things, I never got to go there when he was there, but I just I always wanted to go there. One of the things I thought was amazing, they had citizens from 110 nations in their congregation. Wow. That sounds like the church God would have. Yeah. 
a hundred and citizens from 110 different nations in one building serving God together. See, I think that's God's order. I don't think God does things according to our worldly standards and our order. Our order sometimes don't even make sense. Our order is not working real well in this world. Have you noticed that? Our order doesn't have a cell phone going on in the middle of a sermon. <laughs> I wouldn't answer this, Mr. President. <laughs> God's order is a church that is seeking and zealous in coveting the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit needs to be the administrator of our church and of our services to see the manifestation of the power of God that we always pursue mm -hmm. and desire to see. Imagine what God's church would look like if we really allowed the Holy Spirit to put the pieces together. We'd be a funny looking bunch, I'm sure, but it would be powerful. <laughs> Amen? <laughs>